Isaiah chapter 9. I encourage you to keep your Bibles open to Isaiah. We will begin in Isaiah 9. I'm going to actually turn to a number of passages in Isaiah this morning. We'll begin in Isaiah 9. Please follow along as I read verses 1 and 2, and then 6 and 7. But there will be no gloom for her who was in anguish. In the former time, he brought into contempt the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali. But in the latter time, he has made glorious the way of the sea, the land beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the nations. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelled in a land of deep darkness, on them has light shone. Verse 6. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given. And the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and of peace, there will be no end. On the throne of David and over his kingdom, to establish it and to uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time forth and forevermore, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. Let's pray once more together. Our Father in heaven, we pray what we know not you would teach us, what we have not you would give us, what we are not you would make us, for Jesus' sake, amen. Christmas brings the reign and rule of Jesus Christ, the King. Joy to the world, the Lord is come. Let earth receive her king. Let every heart prepare him room in heaven and nature sing. Joy to the earth, the Savior reigns. Let men their songs employ, while fields and floods, rocks, hills, and plains repeat the sounding joy. He rules the world with truth and grace and makes the nations prove the glories of his righteousness and wonders of his love. Last week we considered the coming of this great king in fulfillment of God's promise in multiple places in Isaiah, particularly in Isaiah 11 verses 1 and 2. This morning I'd like us to consider what the reign and rule of the Christ, this king, will be like from the perspective of Isaiah's prophecy. What will it be like when Jesus reigns? And what do we learn from Isaiah on this point? We certainly learn much more about the rule of the Messiah in the Gospels, in the the New Testament, and in the epistles of the New Testament as well. But this morning, I want to simply contemplate the picture that we get in Isaiah. This Advent series, this short series has been in Isaiah, so we'll remain in Isaiah this morning. As we do, I want to encourage you to remember a few things. Uh, Remember as we look at the prophecy of Isaiah... Uh, what was said by the Apostle Peter in 1 Peter 1, 10 through 12. He said, concerning this salvation, our salvation, the prophets who prophesied about the grace that was to be yours searched and inquired carefully, inquiring what person or time the Spirit of Christ in them was indicating when he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the subsequent glories. It was revealed to them that they were serving not themselves, but you, in the things that have now been announced to you through those who preach the good news to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, things into which angels long to look. So I said this a couple of weeks ago when I introduced this series, you should not expect to see in Isaiah the same degree of revelatory clarity that we have in the New Testament. You get that, right? Isaiah does not have an advantage over us. We have an advantage over Isaiah. We have the completed canon. We have the incarnation, death, and resurrection of the Son of God. We have the Holy Spirit among His people. We have the church. We see things with greater clarity than Isaiah saw them. You want to remember that as we look at these passages uh, together. You might remember the mountain illustration I used, not at all original to me. Uh, You can look at a mountain range from one angle, and it might appear as just one mountain. You look at it from another angle, you'll see that there are actually many peaks and many valleys, and there's multiple mountains in this range. It constitutes a range. You might apply that kind of illustration to Isaiah. 
Isaiah seemed to think, or at least his prophecy seems to read in some places as though everything is all going to happen at once. Well, what we know this side of the cross is that it was the purpose of God in Christ to come once to deal with our sins, and then once again, which we're waiting for, to bring us safely into glory, into the new heavens and into the new earth. God is not recreating the world at the precise time in which he sends his son in the first coming and the incarnation. We recognize there's texture, there's layers to this, there's time and distance and different chapters yet to be unfolded. You read Isaiah, it seems like everything is kind of all happening at once. Well, it's important to remember that as we interpret this book. Also, it's important to note Isaiah, like many of the other prophets, when he is speaking about future events, uh, things that have occurred now in history in the coming of Christ, things that are yet to come uh, when he comes again and remakes the world, uh, when Isaiah is talking about those things, he will often use and even limit him, himself to the kind of categories and terms and ideas that the Jews of the Old Testament would have understood. Okay, so if Isaiah is speaking about salvation going to the nations, he might talk about the people streaming into Jerusalem. That's the category the Israelites would have understood. God's people will come to Jerusalem. Uh, if he is uh, uh, speaking uh, perhaps about recreating the world and making a new heavens and a new earth, he may speak of God restoring the fortunes of Zion. Uh, one thing that we appreciate, of course, this side of the cross is that so many of the promises made to Israel, to the, the new Jerusalem, uh, to God's people are actually fulfilled in the church, not in ethnic Israel. We are the true Israel. We are the new Jerusalem. Many of those promises that might seem to have only application to historical ethnic Israel actually are talking about us and our inheritance and our salvation. It's important you see that to understand Isaiah properly. Finally, let me say this before we dive into our outline this morning. There are various details in some of the texts that we're going to look at, uh, texts and details that may provoke questions. Uh, I'm not trying to interpret all of the details this morning. I want to focus on what is obvious in these passages we're going to consider together and I'm interested more in the broad impressions these passages give us about the reign of the Messiah. I'm not trying to be exhaustive in my exposition this morning. There are little details that are included in different prophecies about the king and what his reign will be like. And you wonder, now what does that particular phrase mean or that idea? What's that meant to evoke? We're not going to trace down every detail. I want to focus on the big things, the main things, the broad impressions these passages are meant to give us. Okay, so please have your Bibles open. And Isaiah, I'll ask you to turn to a number of passages Let's start in Isaiah 9, verses 6 through 7. Three points this morning. Point number one, the reign of Christ will be a universal reign. The reign of Christ will be a universal reign. Look with me, if you would, at Isaiah 9, verse 6. He says, for to us a child is born, to us a son is given. He says, to us a child is born. I think uh, that is meant to evoke a sense of the humility of the salvation that is going to come. God's going to bring a light to the nations. It's going to be a child that's born, a delicate picture, a fragile picture, a humble picture. But then he says, to us a son is given. And the emphasis there, I think, is on divine activity, God giving a son, God doing something for his people, a royal heir of this child will be. He says, then, and the government shall be upon his shoulder. The one who is to come, Isaiah speaks of, the Christ, the light to the people in darkness, the Savior of God's people, he will be apparently a great ruler, a king. The government shall be upon his shoulder. The idea is he will bear on his shoulders the burden of rule. Or you might imagine that classic picture of Atlas holding the world on his shoulders. You know what I'm talking about, Atlas holding up the earth. Well, there's something of the image here. The Christ will carry the burden of rule on his shoulders. Strong and broad shoulders he will have. Strong and broad shoulders are a symbol of power and might and authority. If, if I were to say to our church, you know, we, we pray that God would give us uh, leaders in our church, elders in our church, who would have broad shoulders, what would I mean? These are men capable, we hope, of significant leadership. They can carry the burden of leadership. That's how this language is working. The Christ will have broad shoulders, and upon those broad shoulders will rest the burden of universal reign 
and rule. Authority, power, rule, government will rest on his broad and mighty shoulders. And then we read on in verse 6, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Verse 7, of the increase of his government and of peace, there will be no end. On the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time forth and forevermore, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. The government, we learn, will be upon his shoulder, and this is where the universal nature of his reign comes in in verse 7, of the increase of his government and of peace, there will be no end. This isn't a local rule. This isn't a parochial rule rule. Of the increase of his government and of peace, there will be no end. The idea is ever accumulating rule, ever expanding authority. This Messiah, the Christ, he will reign, he will rule until he rules over all. His reign will be a universal reign. His government will have no limits and no borders. There will be no end of its increase. There will not be, friends, a single foot outside the umbrella of Jesus' lordship. Isaiah is putting forth a vision for the Christ's universal reign. His rule, his government, his authority will extend not only to Israel. It's going to be better than David's rule. David didn't rule over the nations. He ruled over the people of Israel. This rule and reign will extend beyond that. It will extend indeed, to all the earth. I turned our attention to Isaiah 42 just a couple of weeks ago. You don't need to turn there. I'm just going to read a verse or two. Isaiah 42, 1, we see a similar idea. Behold, my servant whom I uphold, my chosen and whom my soul delights, I have put my spirit upon him. He will bring forth justice to the nations. Verse 4, he will not grow faint or be discouraged till he has established justice in the earth and the coastlands. Wait for his law. How far will his reign extend? It will extend to the nations, to the ends of the earth, to the coastlands. His rule will be universal rule. This is the vision Isaiah is trying to set forth for us. It is also, by the way, the vision that is set forth by the Psalter. All over the place in the Psalms, there's this emphasis on the universal reign of God's King, of the Lord who is going to come. A well-known Messianic psalm in Psalm 2, as quoted several times in the New Testament, makes this point. Psalm 2, verse 6 says this, As for me, it's the Lord speaking, I have set my king on Zion, my holy hill. I will tell of the decree. The Lord said to me, You are my son. Today I have begotten you. Ask of me, and I will make the nations your heritage, the ends of the earth your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron and dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. Now therefore, O kings, be wise. Be warned, O rulers of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear. and Rejoice with trembling. Kiss the Son, lest he be angry and you perish in the way, for his wrath is quickly kindled. Blessed are all who take refuge in him. Of course, the issue of the universal reign of the Christ, of the Lord, of the Messiah, is a major emphasis of the New Testament as well. The New Testament authors write again and again of Jesus' universal lordship. I could multiply dozens of passages at this point. I'll just quote a couple. Philippians 2 verse 9, therefore God has highly exalted him, the Christ, and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Ephesians 1 verse 20, God raised Christ from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion, and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. And he put all things under his feet and gave him his head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. Uh, brothers and sisters, what's the picture we get from these and other passages? It is one of absolute universal, total reign and rule. Christ will have lordship over all. His rule has been inaugurated already, and it will be consummated fully when Christ comes again. But make no mistake, the day is coming when every knee will bow. Uh, your knee, whether you identify as a Christian or not, will bow. And your tongue, whether you're a Christian or not, will confess that Jesus is Lord. The knee of 
President Biden, the knee of the candidates running against him, Donald Trump and the others. They will bow. Their tongues will confess. Jesus' universal reign and lordship will be vindicated before the whole world. Indeed, the coastlands will wait for his law. He will establish justice in the earth. Of the increase of his government, there will be no end. As Isaac Watts says in his famous hymn that we should start singing here, Jesus shall reign where'er the sun does its successive journeys run. His kingdom stretch from shore to shore till moons shall wax and wane no more. Friends, that day is coming. And Jesus will have universal reign in the whole world will acknowledge it. Habakkuk 2.14, for the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Friends, I just encourage you, remember this vision when you see God's people persecuted and martyred in the world today. Remember this vision when we contemplate together the work of missions here in our church. Remember this vision when we commission a new missionary or support a new church planter. Remember this vision when you come to a prayer meeting and we pray for the nations and for the lost in our own families and in our own community. Remember this vision as you look upon the wickedness of the world around you. Remember this vision when you see pride displays and drag queen story hour. Remember this vision when you read the headlines or scroll through your news feed. Remember this vision when you see God's will desecrated in the public square. Remember this vision when this world looks like a dark and dismal place and when it seems that all around you evil is triumphing. Remember this vision in the day of small things. Remember this vision in days of sowing. Remember this vision when you cannot imagine its fulfillment. Christ will have universal reign and rule. He will reign over all. Of the increase of his government, there will be no end. It will allow for no obstacles and no impediments. That's point number one. The reign of Christ will be a universal reign. Point number two. The reign of Christ will be marked by perfect righteousness, justice, and peace. The reign of Christ will be marked by perfect righteousness, justice, and peace. His reign and rule will embrace the whole universe, the cosmos, heaven and earth. Yes and amen. But what will this rule and reign be like? And Isaiah's basic answer is that it will be in every way perfect. Listen now, Isaiah expresses this in Isaiah 6. For to us a child is born... To us the Son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. His reign will be so much characterized by peace, by wholeness, by shalom, by prosperity, that his very title will be Prince of Peace. Peace is what he brings. Peace will mark his rule. And you think of what that would have meant for Israel. They'd been in slavery in Egypt. They had known conflict in uh, taking the land of Canaan. All kinds of wars with enemies without, even civil wars from within. The Assyrian captivity, the Babylonian captivity, destruction, warfare, bondage. But when the Messiah comes, only peace. Uh, He will, as I think it was Zechariah who said, guide our feet into the path of peace. Then verse 7, of the increase of his government and of peace, there will be no end. On the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time forth and forevermore. Peace, justice, and righteousness increasing to every corner of the world. That's the vision that's being held forth. And the peace, justice, and righteousness he will establish will never expire. Isaiah says it will be this way forevermore. I can't tell you the number of articles I've read just in my lifetime, even just the last few years, that ask the question, you know, is, is, is this going to be World War III? Some event happens in the Middle East, or some event happens in Russia, or some event happens 
even in our own country, like 9-11. People ask, is this, is, this, is this the next world war? When Jesus consummates his rule, there will be no more world wars. There will be no possibility of global conflict. No, his rule will know only peace and perfect justice and perfect righteousness. Now you appreciate the vision Isaiah is putting forward, not just a universal rule, but a perfect rule. Look at how this is expressed in another passage, Isaiah 11, if you would turn just two chapters over to Isaiah 11. Here another royal prophecy and a description of what the Lord's rule will be like. Verse 1, there shall come forth a shoot from the stump of Jesse, and a branch from his root shall bear fruit, Isaiah eleven two, 2, and the spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, royal anointing, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord, and his delight shall be in the fear of the Lord. He shall not judge by what his eyes see or decide disputes by what his ears hear. In other words, he shall rule in the fear of the Lord. The fear of the Lord will be the standard of his rule. And his rule, we're told, will not be limited by what he sees with his eyes or what he hears with his ears. His perfect rule will spring from within him. He will rule the people out of the overflow of his being, out of the overflow of his wisdom and perfection. He will not have to depend, like our rulers, on eyewitness testimony or the hearing of oral arguments in order to adjudicate matters. No, he will reign by perfect omniscience, by supreme wisdom, by divine fiat. There will be no need for courts or for trials or for testimony to be heard because he will rule by perfect knowledge and perfect justice. He will need no judicial resources other than himself. Then verse four of chapter 11, but with righteousness He shall judge the poor and decide with equity for the meek of the earth. The poor will no longer be abused as they so often are in our world today. They will not be taken advantage of, nor will they be given preferential treatment. The poor will be judged with righteousness, and he will decide their case with equity. And uh, if we read the whole book of Isaiah, we'd appreciate there is a contrast that Isaiah is setting up here. Isaiah is deliberately trying to contrast, or God through Isaiah, is trying to contrast the rule of this king with the present rule of Israel's rulers. What did they look like? What was their rule and reign like? Well, we heard about it in an earlier sermon a couple weeks ago in Isaiah 1, verse 21, how the faithful city has become a whore, she who was full of justice, righteousness lodged in her, but now murderers. Your silver has become dross, your best wine mixed with water. Your princes are rebels and companions companions of thieves. Everyone loves a bribe and runs after gifts. They do not bring justice to the fatherless, and the widow's cause does not come to them. In contrast to this picture of lousy rulers who take bribes, who abuse the poor, who abuse the fatherless and the widow, the Messiah's rule will be marked by perfect righteousness and equity. Under the rule of the Messiah, there will never be a miscarriage of justice ever again. You who have been victims of a miscarriage of justice, may God help you to find comfort in this. There will be no more miscarriages of justice. Jesus reign and rule. As Psalm 96.10 says, the Lord reigns, and he will judge the peoples with equity. We don't see equity in our day. We see partiality everywhere in our world, but in his kingdom, perfect equity. Back in Isaiah 11, verse 4, but with righteousness, he shall judge the poor and decide with equity for the meek of the earth, and he shall strike the earth with the rod of his mouth, and with the breath of his lips he shall kill the wicked. No more can evil and wickedness abound when he reigns, when his rule is established. When his rule comes in its fullness, the wicked will be extinguished from the earth. Verse 5, I love this. Righteousness shall be the belt of his waist and faithfulness the belt of his loins. What a glorious picture of the reign of this king. Righteousness he will wear like a belt. He will wear faithfulness like a belt. Friends, could this picture accurately apply 
to any of the rulers we have ever had. That the sons of men ruled with righteousness as their belt. Could that be said of Alexander the Great, or Julius Caesar, or Charlemagne, or Napoleon, or Queen Elizabeth I, or Queen Victoria, or Ronald Reagan, or Margaret Thatcher? Have any of them ruled like this? Could this picture apply to them? Righteousness, justice, faithfulness, worn like a belt around their waist. Again, Isaiah 42 offers a similar picture. I invite you to turn there now to Isaiah 42. This picture of the Messiah ruling with a perfect reign and perfect peace, righteousness, and justice. Isaiah 42, verse 1. Behold, my servant whom I uphold, my chosen in whom my soul delights, I have put my spirit upon him. He will bring forth justice to the nations. He will not cry aloud or lift up his voice or make it heard in the street. A bruised reed he will not break, and a faintly burning wick he will not quench. He will faithfully bring forth justice. He will not grow faint or be discouraged till he has established justice in the earth and the coastlands wait for his law. Again, another striking image of the magnificent rule of the Messiah, the servant of the Lord. When he comes, his reign will be perfect. Friends, what is Isaiah trying to get across to us? What's the the headline news, the big impression that we're to receive from these images? He wants us to appreciate that not only will Christ reign over all, but his reign will be perfect in every way. As I said, under Christ's reign, there will never be another miscarriage of justice. We're so accustomed to this. So much injustice in our world. Just a part of life. But it will not be so under Christ's reign. No lie will ever be permitted to stand when Christ comes to rule. There will be no bearing false witness, no slander, no bullying, no gossip, no stealing, no theft. Under Christ's rule and reign, no one will have to lock their doors anymore. You won't need keys in Christ's kingdom. No woman will ever feel unsafe going anywhere ever again. The poor and the vulnerable of this world will not be subject to abuse and manipulation. There will be no bribes, no embezzlement, no corruption. Furthermore, in Christ's kingdom, under his perfect rule, there will be no wars, no shedding of blood, no violence. Nothing like that will have a place in Christ's kingdom. There will be no abortion mills. There will be no physical abuse, no murder, no genocide, no terrorist attacks, nothing. No one will ever feel in danger ever again. You'll never feel in physical danger ever again under Christ's reign and rule. There will be no division and alienation. No need ever for revolution or reform. No more political debates and no more elections. There will be no rival platforms or policies, no political parties or factions. There will be one party, one platform, one policy, it will be Christ's. It will be a platform of perfect justice, righteousness, and peace. When Christ rules, there will be nothing but wholeness, safety, well-being, prosperity, flourishing, and joy. Friends, in his kingdom, the leaf is always green. He only serves the best wine. The music and the songs are always the best. There's no duds in the set list in the Lord's kingdom. Everyone there has their place. Everyone there belongs. And in his kingdom, there are no squabbles or rivalries or divisions. Just peace, never war. Only pleasure, never pain. Always the holidays and never the school term. In a word, Christ's rule and reign will be perfect paradise. Uh, it is always astounding to me as I read history or I listen to politicians today Uh, to hear people express optimism about mankind's ability to devise a government system that can yield a kind of utopia. Uh, Whether it's communism or republicanism or democracy or some kind of futuristic technocracy that will solve all of our problems. Uh, Friends, I just appeal to your background, education, your judgment. What evidence am I missing that validates this kind of optimism. 
Am I missing some silver bullet passage in history that gives us reason to think we can figure out human rule and government? I'll certainly grant you some forms of government are preferable to others, but that's like picking the best apple out of a rotten bunch. I think it was Winston Churchill who said, uh, democracy is the worst form of human government, except, of course, for all the others. No, friends, we were always meant to live under the rule of a benevolent monarchy. That's the perfect system. There's only one person who can rule this kind of a benevolent monarchy, a monarchy with Jesus Christ on the throne, ruling in perfect righteousness, justice, and peace. Okay, point number one, the reign of Christ will be a universal reign. Point number two, the reign of Christ will be marked by perfect righteousness, justice, and peace. Point number three, the reign of Christ will secure the salvation of his people and the destruction of his enemies. The reign of Christ will secure the salvation of his people and the destruction of his enemies. Consider first the salvation of his people. You're in, hopefully, Isaiah 42. Let's read on in verse 5. The servant of the Lord is sent forth, we read here, to deliver his people. Thus says God the Lord, verse 5, who created the heavens and stretched them out, who spread out the earth and what comes from it, who gives breath to the people on it and spirit to those who walk in it. I am the Lord. I've called you in righteousness. I will take you by the hand and keep you, speaking to the servant of the Lord, the Messiah. I will give you as a covenant for the people, a light for the nations, to open the eyes of the blind, to bring out the prisoners from the dungeon, from the prison those who sit in darkness. I am the Lord, that is my name, my glory I give to no other, nor my praise to carved idols. Behold, the former things have come to pass, the new things I now declare. Before they spring forth, I tell you of them. Uh, Friends, these images of deliverance to captives, shining light on those who dwell in darkness, giving freedom to those who are in bondage, giving sight to those who are blind, these images pervade Isaiah's prophecy. Isaiah 61 verse 1, which Jesus quotes in the synagogue in Luke 4, says a similar thing, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to those who are bound, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. These are all symbols, friends, of salvation that the Messiah will bring for his people when he comes. The rule of the Messiah will mean freedom from sin's bondage, liberty from death's tyranny, and emancipation from all sorrow and anguish. The rule of Christ will bring deliverance for all his people. Another striking and beautiful description of the deliverance he will bring is found in Isaiah 40. I ask you to turn back to Isaiah 40 now. In Isaiah 40, verse 9, here we read of the deliverance that Christ will bring for his people. Go on up to a high mountain, O Zion, herald of good news. Lift up your voice with strength. O Jerusalem, herald of good news. Lift it up. Fear not. Say to the cities of Judah, what? Behold your God. Behold, the Lord comes with might, and his arm rules for him. Behold, his reward is with him, and his recompense before him. The Lord, this great and mighty ruler, comes, and what will he do for his people when he comes? Here comes the mighty one. Here comes God. Here comes the ruler of the peoples. What's he going to do for his elect, for his redeemed? Verse 11, he will tend his flock like a shepherd. He will gather the lambs in his arms. He will carry them in his bosom and gently lead those that are with young. It's a beautiful image, a tender image of the Lord's reign and rule over his people. He comes not only as our king, he comes as our shepherd to bear away his sheep. When the king comes, the master comes to reward his servants. The savior comes to give final deliverance from sin and Satan. The rule of Christ means salvation for his people. The shepherd comes to gather his lambs and to save them. Revelation 7 brings to us the fulfillment of this prophecy. You don't need to turn there, but there in heaven we read this, verse 16. They shall hunger no more, neither thirst any more. 
The sun shall not strike them nor any scorching heat. And the image is picked up. For the lamb in the midst of the throne will be their shepherd. And he will guide them to the springs of living water. God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Uh, friends, the rule and reign of Christ, this universal reign, this reign of perfect peace, justice, and righteousness, it comes to save you. Christ and his reign and rule will deliver his people from their sins, from all their fears, from all that makes them anxious, from sin and sorrow and death forevermore. Christ's rule will save us. It will deliver his people. Okay, but note also, the reign of Christ will not only secure the salvation of his people, it will also secure the destruction of his enemies. Remember we read back in Isaiah 11 verse 4, but with righteousness he shall judge the poor and decide with equity for the meek of the earth. He shall strike the earth with the rod of his mouth and with the breath of his lips he shall kill the wicked. There may be some here who continue to live in sin and practice wickedness. One day the Son of God will kill you. Psalm 2 that we considered earlier, you shall break them with a rod of iron, dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. Psalm 110, speaking of the coming rule, the Messiah says in verse 6, he will fill the nations with corpses. Turn, if you would, to Isaiah 63. Isaiah 63, verse 1. Who is this who comes from Edom? In crimson garments from Bozrah. He was splendid in his apparel, marching in the greatness of his strength. It is I speaking in righteousness, mighty to save. Why is your apparel red and your garments like his who treads in the winepress? I have trodden the winepress alone, and from the peoples no one was with me. I trod them in my anger and trampled them in my wrath. Their lifeblood spattered on my garments and stained all my apparel. For the day of vengeance was in my heart. My year of redemption had come. I looked, but there was no one to help. I was appalled, but there was no one to uphold. So my own arm brought me salvation, and my wrath upheld me. I trampled down the peoples in my anger. I made them drunk in my wrath. And I poured out their lifeblood on the earth. How terrifying. I almost tremble to read this. And pictures like this are far more common in the Bible than we would often think. Because many Christians and preachers in our day are embarrassed by them. The man from Edom is coming. He will destroy all his enemies. I just tremble to think that there could be anyone here that would know Jesus like this. This image is fulfilled in Revelation 19. Marriage Supper of the Lamb. And there we see Jesus coming now to establish his reign and rule in the earth. And he tramples the people. And his garments are stained with blood, their blood. And it says there, they're going to see something 
written on his waist and on his thigh. Do you know what they see written there? The wicked, the ones who rejected Christ, died in their sins. Do you know what they see written on the thigh of the Lord? The King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Jesus Christ will indeed reign. And his reign will mean salvation for his people. And it will mean terror for all his enemies. Concerning Christ's rule as it's presented in Isaiah, we have seen that. First, the reign of Christ will be a universal reign. Second, the reign of Christ will be marked by perfect righteousness, justice, and peace. Thirdly, the reign of Christ will secure the salvation of his people and the destruction of his enemies. I close with two questions. Number one, when will this glorious reign and rule take place? That's the question, isn't it? When does the reign and rule take place? People wonder about this. Has the kingdom come or is it still to come? Does Christ reign now or will he reign then? I don't have time to construct a careful biblical argument, but I think the teaching of Scripture is very plain on this issue. The Bible teaches that the rule of the Lord Jesus Christ is inaugurated in his incarnation, death, and resurrection, and ascension. But it's not yet consummated. He will rule, bring all things into subjection under his feet, when he comes again. Uh, Hebrews 2 makes the point that in fulfillment of Psalm 8, indeed, all things have been put in subjection under his feet, but then adds this caveat, but we don't presently see all things in subjection to him. No, right now, Jesus is expanding his kingdom and his rule through offering his gospel to individual sinners. That's how he's expanding his kingdom. Can't be part of the kingdom, Jesus says to Nicodemus, unless you're born again. God's kingdom is not passed through crusades. It's not extended through the passing of legislation. God's kingdom is extended through men and women, through regeneration and faith, bowing the knee to King Jesus. But there is coming a day where that reign will be fully consummated, and the time of salvation will be over. He will come back to ransom his people, to bear his sheep away, and to give them everlasting paradise forever with him. And it is in that day also he will vanquish all his enemies. He will destroy them. And he will establish his reign and rule in a new heavens and new earth where justice and peace and righteousness will shine like the sun. And we'll never know sin or sorrow or death ever again. When will this rule occur? It's been inaugurated already. We have believed on Christ to come under this rule. It will be consummated on the last day. The second question, and the more important question, how can this rule save me and not damn me? How can this rule save me and not destroy me? How can I know Jesus as the tender shepherd and not the man from Edom. Friends, the good news is that Jesus has his arms spread wide to welcome any sinner who would wish to come and submit themselves to his rule. He has his arms spread wide. He sent forth his messengers into the world through his word and through preachers of the gospel and through the evangelists. That if you turn from your sins and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, he will be naught but a savior to you. He'll purge you from all your sins. Your blood will not be shed on that great and final day, for his blood will have been shed on your account. You could be safe under the benevolent rule of King Jesus. His rule and reign will be nothing but good news to you. 
His coming again will be like what the author of the Hebrews says at the end of chapter 9, I think it is. He came once again, to, he came once first to offer himself up once for all for our sins. He's coming again to save those and all who love his appearing. He won't have to deal with your sins then. He's dealt with them already at the cross of Jesus Christ. But friends, I would give to you the word of the psalmist. Kiss the son. Let's see if you become angry and you perish in the way. Come to Jesus Christ the King. He'll have you. He'll receive you. He doesn't want to destroy you. He wants you to believe, to have Him as your Savior and your King and your Lord that you might be saved and not destroyed. Friends, I beg you, embrace the King of the universe. Embrace the Lord Jesus Christ, the son of David, the only potentate, the only sovereign, the one who alone is worthy of all rule and reign, all authority and power. He is coming again. And for us who are the children of God, that will mean paradise forever. For those who refuse him, horror and terror when the king comes to establish his rule. But he invites you now. He invites you now. Come to me. Come to me. I'll save you. I'll deliver you. Come inside. I'll be a shepherd to you. Why would you hate your own souls? Why would you perish? Why would you die, God says to the prophet Isaiah? There is a Savior. He is the great King, and He's willing to receive you this day if you do not harden your heart. Let's pray together. Our Father in heaven, we know and believe Jesus Christ is Lord. He alone is king. He alone has claimed the reign and rule over our hearts and our lives. We pray that you would move in us to submit ourselves to him, to not be hard-hearted, to give up rebellion, sin against you. Move in us to turn to you, to embrace you, to accept the king who has come. Indeed, Christmas is good news to all those who are saved. It is a terror to the wicked. Please, Lord, rule in all our hearts alone. Come and save us all and give us Jesus. Make him to be our mighty shepherd, our mighty king. We pray together in Jesus' name. Amen.